Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, January 8th, 2019 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The malware of the day analyzed by DDA today is an encrypted Microsoft Office document. So we have seen quite a few of them in the past. Now, did he put together a little brute force tool for these type of documents in case you do not have the password. The password is usually listed in the body of the email, but if you just have the attachment, you no longer have the body, then it can be useful to brute force the password. And since these passwords are usually rather simple, like short numbers, and the like, it shouldn't be too hard to do this. In this particular case, it was just one, two, three, four. And as usual, the malware actually turned out to be a downloader that was then used to retrieve additional malware from a web server. One interesting sort of little thing here is the URL was just an IP address. One way how you can actually spot a lot of these suspicious downloads is if you are looking for host headers that are IP addresses instead of a host name, that's somewhat unusual and sometimes used by malware, like in this case. Then we got a blog post from Vandera about how to spot malicious applications and they focused here on iOS, so malicious applications in Apple's App Store. Now they use this somewhat to illustrate their checklist they sort of have uh, that gives you clues as to what application may be malicious. One interesting thing they ran into is a few applications that actually connected with a command and control server that's commonly associated with the Golduck malware. Now. Apple doesn't allow any additional code to be loaded this way, but all it takes is a vulnerability that would make that possible. Right now it appears that this command control server is mostly gathering information from the device, like IP address and a couple of other items that are accessible to the software, and it will also then push ads to the device. These ads only affect the, this particular application, so it doesn't really affect the operating system overall. The sandboxing still works here, but uh, of course, this is the kind of activity that's really hard to vet and detect during any kind of testing process that Apple, Apple undertakes. But in general, the five different clues that they're offering here to detect possibly malicious applications, I think apply even to desktop and other applications, certainly not just to iOS. And the National Counterintelligence and Security Center, short NCSC, has published a number of videos, tips, and other materials to help protect the US industry from foreign intelligence operations. Now, you've probably all heard about nation state attacks and such trying to steal intellectual property. The materials being presented here are certainly not just useful for US companies, and well, they're all open to download for everybody. They're pretty high level, so don't expect a lot of sort of detailed indicators of compromise and the like, uh, but I think it may be something useful to point executives to before they, for example, travel uh, to a foreign country. And even within the US, actually, a lot of the tips still sort of apply, like, for example, being careful what networks you're connecting to, watching your systems, and uh, also being careful with social media accounts and uh, passwords. And then we got a new side channel attack. And uh, well, what's uh, different about this side channel attack is that for a change, it's not based on a vulnerability in particular processors. Instead, this particular vulnerability exists across different hardware platforms and affects Linux as well as Windows, even though to a different extent. The problem here is the operating system's page cache. So, if multiple pieces of software are using the same library, then only one copy of that library is loaded into memory, and then this piece of memory 
is then mapped into the different virtual memory spaces of uh, these individual processes. And this isn't just true for libraries. Uh, this can happen to any data being loaded from disk. Uh, if multiple processes, for example, access the same file, same thing happens. But where things get tricky is uh, once one process starts manipulating this part of memory, then of course it needs to split it up and needs to create a separate copy for this process. Uh, and then eventually maybe write it back to disk if that's what this process is doing. Now, there are a number of different attacks that are being proposed here. In part, they rely on that the attacker first evicts uh, the data from these shared memory areas and then looks at the timing when the data is being loaded back by some other process. So for example, probably the simplest attack here, an attacker could detect uh, when the password dialog log is being displayed and then overlay it with their own password dialog just in the right moment. More interesting vulnerabilities are, for example, keystroke timing attacks, where the attacker is able to detect when a key is being pressed, not necessarily which key, but again, that uh, can sometimes be useful. And uh, they also very able to actually affect the PHP password generation. That's an interesting across the network attack, and they showed it's uh, possible to exploit this in PHP MyFAQ, which is uh, framework uh, that's uh, quite popular. Now, Windows supposedly has a fix in the works that's about to be released for this particular vulnerability. All of this can be addressed in software. Linux is also working on a fix. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.